Matt, thanks very much. And it's a great pleasure to be here again today. This is our sixth family day. And it's such an inspiring day. I mean, we've, over the last couple of years, in introduced sort of the Safe Side Youth Ambassadors. And I was just completely blown away by Brody and Lara and uh, Renee. And then Nicole, who gave this, the talks. I mean, that's what inspires us to do the job that we're doing and sort of to motivate us to keep doing the research, keep applying for those ethics committee applications at midnight and so forth. But what I wanted to do today is sort of go through some of the things that have changed and uh, in reflecting on the change that's occurred really over the last uh, six years since we've been doing this. And uh, the, if you go to the first slide, but when we just to highlight an overview and then just briefly, there's about eight or nine different research groups. And I say that the numbers because we've just added an artificial intelligence group as well to add uh, analysing big data to the research for understanding and trying to prevent blindness. So there's a lot of groups. So what I wanted to do today if we, is to place initially us in context. So if we look at uh, the impact of health on children, three of those top ten conditions that affect children in Australia are eye problems. They might be sort of more easily correctable, sort of refractive error. But if you come down the list, and they're on the screen here, they're in the yellow, what the eye conditions. Just underneath the sort of top 10 is ocular motility, so strabismus things. But what's sort of interesting is that children's cataract and um, is sort of, is just as common as cerebral palsy. Then the retinal dystrophies, which is sort of a common group amongst people here today, they're about five times more common than children's cancer. So we've sort of got these eye conditions that affect a lot of people, and that's part of where our desire is to try and find ways to improve vision. So we go to the next one. <coughs> when we started this six years ago, we were sort of trying to make diagnoses with genetic diagnosis, and Professor Jamison is going to talk about that more in the moment, but there were some questions that came in before wanting us to talk about it, but I've just put on the screen here a couple of screenshots from clinicaltrials.org, which is the main sort of area for listing clinical trials in the world, and that's sponsored by the National Institute of Health. And there's just on these, we've had a change in sort of from trying to look at therapies or unusual things to having trials now looking at gene therapy, stem cell replacements. And there's 149 listed there just for retinitis pigmentosa at present, and there's about 20 on the top left here looking at people with, for labor's congenital am amaurosis. So this has been the change that's been occurring, that where we've gone from di trying to make the diagnosis genetically, we're now going into looking at therapies. And so the way we sort of have to look at this, it's becoming a partnership between people who are affected by these conditions and the doctors and researchers trying to work them out to try and work out well, what does it really matter and how does it, what will in improvement and what will treatment look like. And when we look at sort of, if you're going to try and get a me medicine or a therapy uh, registered, the FDA in America have sort of said we've got to have direct endpoints. And they've finally changed it to be clinically meaningful endpoints. And that's an important distinction because the, you have to have something that's actually relevant to people's lives and the way they go. So just because it, a serum measure changes or a change on a, on a, a structural test like our OCT machine, does that really mean or translate into something that's making a difference? So we need to sort of work out what are the endpoints that are actually going to be beneficial. And that's going to lead on to some of the work that I'll talk about in a moment. So we go to the next one. The next part is sort of these biomarkers, you know, what are relevant? So, so measuring vision is important, but some people with low vision can't see the eye chart and you can't quantify that. So is there other ways of doing that? And that's one of the things that has been evolving, and we've been involved in that area as well. And going even further, and I uh, just want to mention briefly, because Alex Ferdy is going to speak in third in this session, he's got some real examples of what SafeSight's been doing about this, but patient reported outcomes. It's becoming apparent, which has perhaps taken medical research a long time to come, that what people with the condition have, how they experience it, actually is important, and that may actually be a more important measure of whether the treatments work or not. And so understanding patient reporting outcomes is a whole new area that we're working on. And so that's going to be a greater partnership between all of us here today. So this is sort of the, the big news in um, 
genetic therapies so that in December 2017, the FDA approved a novel gene therapy to treat patients with a rare form of inherited vision loss, and that's one, of one form of Labor's congenital amaurosis. And the medication is called Lux Turner, and it's a gene therapy agent. And so this has been a change. So this has taken 20 years to get to this point. So the first clinical trials were reported in 2008, and then another 10 or 11 years to get from the clinical trial outcomes to actually getting it registered. So it's been a long-term process. But this sort of, we see, will probably start to open the floodgates to help with all the other genetic therapies. One of their things was the FDA came across said, well, how do you measure a meaningful response for somebody who's really been so-called blind since birth, who can't see the chart? And they came up with this test called the multi-luminance mobility test. So it's actually a maze, essentially, where you have to walk through under different luminance conditions. And so looking at the time, and people who had this condition, Labor's congenital amaurosis, and we've heard from Lara and Renee today, who've got, this, or got a form of this, night vision difficulty is really challenging for them. And so changing the illumination levels was one way of assessing it, how they can go through it. But they, and so they measured before and after. And essentially, after the gene therapy, they didn't change on the chart, but their ability to navigate this maze improved remarkably. And so that became a meaningful measure for seeing the success of this therapy. And so with that in mind, we've now got other ways of trying to monitor these outcomes. So what I'd like to just briefly cover in the rest of this talk is some of the work we've been doing on biomarkers, looking at clinically meaningful outcome measures and sort of patient reported outcome measures that we've been doing here. So we've published this study on uh, the, probably the commonest cause of male inherited blindness in childhood, so juvenile X-linked retinoschisis, and using a drug that's available for other things. And we looked at whether we could improve that. This is the first sort of randomised prospective study done in this condition around the world. and and. This one looked at, did this medication make a difference? And it improved visual acuity, but it didn't change the shape of the retina. But it gave us some good insights into what might be useful into evaluating how uh, we might improve things. And in fact, we've just um, come back from the National Institute of, uh, National Institute of Health in, the, in America, and they're running a gene therapy trial in this area. So some of the, the biomarkers we've developed here, they're also now using. Another area is, is Usher's syndrome. That's a condition where you have the combination of retinitis pigmentosa and deafness. And the, some of the genes there are being evaluated for gene therapy. The question is, well, what measures do we need to take will, will help us work out whether this therapy is actually useful or not? And that's where we've been looking at some of the technologies that, to see whether we can correlate those things with function. So looking at our ultra-wide imaging systems, also the structural functions with the optical coherence tomography, and then with functional tests with electrophysiology matching those up and seeing how whether these things actually could give us a measure that will say, well, yes, we have this therapy and we intervene, it actually has an improvement or it slows down the rate of progression. And on that note, what's becoming apparent is we need to understand how the condition is progressing in people. So we need to understand what is happening because often with these retinal disorders, you'll have an initial drop in function, then there seems to be a plateau period and then we drop again. So say you intervene in the plateau phase and nothing progressed, we well, might think that your trial is actually working, but in fact it's just a natural history. So part of the process, we, we need to sort of have regular monitoring of these conditions with the latest technology to try and put this together. So that sort of requires sort of time commitments from all the people who are affected to go through some of these not so pleasant tests, some of them not too bad, but some of them time consuming and a little bit uncomfortable, but that becomes really important in working out who's acceptable for a trial, when's the best time to do treatment, because there's, there's, this is all individualised really, and uh, so that's a partnership that we need to sort of develop over time. And we've looked at these sort of things in, the, in, in this trial, and the, on the screens there you can see some sections from, from optical coherence tomography, which is amazing technology, which sort of gives you a, a cross section of the retina, and we can see the, the retinal cells there that are surviving. And, and there's some bands that we have up there on the screen, some of you will be able to see with numbers looking at the residual areas in the centre. And it's that amount of tissue that clinical trials are looking at, have they got enough of that for us to intervene? And this sort of thing, we're able to correlate that with visual acuity and electrical measures to give a, a functional measure that might be actually meaningful to individuals with the condition. So they were just some overviews there. So we were able to show and come up together with a... Um, 
a, a suite of tools that could sort of assess people. And we presented this at the main vision science meeting in the United States earlier this year. The next area comes back to sort of how to look at these other novel areas. So the, the current licensed drug, Lux Turner for the uh, RPE65 labors congenital amaurosis, it uses essentially a maze and that takes a fair bit of floor space to actually lay that out and to try and standardise that. And if, if you've been to the eye clinics, there's not much space in those places these days. And so what we've done, we've worked with the biomedical engineers and the people who do the bionic eye projects here and come up with a virtual reality mobility assessment maze. And I'll just take you through that for the last little bit here. And so on the screen here, they're wearing these, the person sits with the virtual reality goggles on at a computer and they use a joystick for um, moving around, for navigating that. And the engineers were all excited about putting sensors on so you could actually walk around, but that was, work health and safety didn't allow that. So we have to use a joystick. But essentially the first part of the, the test is to walk down a corridor with cones in it and you have to get, navigate in and out, a bit like Renee going down a ski field with the trees. <laughs> then you go into a, another group of corridors where there's actual people standing still. Then you go to having to walk through a car park, following a path, and finally you come to a footpath and people are walking towards you and away from you and you've got to navigate through them. And on the bottom right of the screen here, you can actually sort of see what it looks like in 3D. So the cones you walk through are actually waist high, so they're quite high, and uh, you can't see over the walls, so you can't see around. And going through the car park, if you can see it on the bottom right here, you can't actually see where the path is because you've actually got to follow it in front of you. So it's actually quite realistic there. And then when you try and walk down with a footpath with the people coming towards you, you've actually got, they're walking at some speed and you've got to try and navigate down. And what the engineers have built into this is sort of how long it takes you to get through there, how many collisions you have with the walls and things. So we go to the next slide. And basically, we've been able to replicate what they've done in the maze. It still needs a lot more work on different lighting conditions, but people with retinitis pigmentosa who've lost their side vision, well, they bump into the walls or the cars all the time. Whereas the people who've got stargast disease who have trouble with central vision, they run over all the cones down the centre. And so we've started to develop a way of doing this in a virtual world to be able to get an endpoint. And so that's one of the things that we've been working on to try and be able to evaluate whether any of these therapies work. And we've been able to find that the virtual obstacle cause has, is a feasible way of doing this. And so we're still in the early days, but there is some uh, progress and to be able to replicate what the FDA has required as a meaningful response. The last part of this is sort of trying to look at, well, how are we going to implement these therapies? Because these therapies are expensive. The, the, the cost for the Lux Turner, which is the one for the labor's congenital amaurosis, it costs half a million dollars per eye, so a million dollars a patient. And so that sounds a large amount of money, and it is, but when you look at the economic benefit of having somebody have that and the function they gain and the greater engagement in the community and then in uh, workforce, well that probably over a lifetime that'll be a good investment. And so we've been working with, uh, we, we produced really the first economic report on low vision in children in the world and we, that was sponsored by the Safe Side Institute. We learnt a lot in that because the models weren't quite right for children and so we've now got an NHMRC sponsored group where we're looking at the health economics for inherited retinal diseases and we're just going through the process. We've had ethics approval. We're now waiting on governance from each individual hospital and this is going to be a cohort looking at the impacts across all the ages. So if, what does it happen before school, at, during school years, during sort of early working then in retirement and we're going to need to be able to interview 20 or 30 people in each of those groups. And what this will provide is well, what is the real impact because at present when economists look at a child with vision impairment, they have this formula where they discount the years ahead because over the next 70 years or whatever, they seem to take off 7% every sort of decade and so. So what I would have thought, and intuitively you would think would be quite an expensive you know, loss of somebody having vision impairment from childhood, they seem to be able to cut the costs right down. So by looking at what is the impact at all the different cohorts, we then hope to be able to provide the real world data. And then this is then support what it's gonna to mean to actually bring these therapies to, the, to individuals with this condition and what the benefit will be over time. And that'll support the cost for this. So I'd like to acknowledge there's a very large team of people that bring this all together. And that's really part of the Safe Sign Institute about the Sydney Eye Hospital, the Children's Hospital Westmead, the Eye Genetics Group, the Bionic Eye Group, 
and the funding. And funding is always a challenge since we've realised that six, Australia is probably 60% underfunded for its medical science research across the board compared to, on a population basis, compared to the United States or Europe. So we're trying to do this uh, with about a third of the funding. But I'd like, I'll end there and uh, we look forward to talking. But this is really the next phase that we're taking on now is where we're looking at treatments and that's going to need really a, a partnership between people with the condition and all the medical practitioners to try and progress to the next stage because we really need the data to show how change will actually be improved by therapies. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. That's great. I especially love the, uh, the, the uh, improvements to the way we could detect changes to, um, to uh, you know, based on therapies. I love it. I think that's really awesome.